And this prayer of Romans 11 verse 9 applies first of all in its context to the reprobate in Israel. Follow with your eye. Verse 7. The rest were blinded. And the rest are the non-elect that we call the reprobate who were hardened. These people are described in verse 8 as those whom God spiritually inebriated so that with eye or ear they couldn't receive the truth of the gospel. And then David says about these same people, verse 9, let their table, these, the reprobate in Israel, let their table be made a snare, a trap, a stumbling block, and a recompense. And their table, the ungodly, unbelieving Jews, have been made such in accordance with this prayer, even if, even if these Jews pray, as many religious Jews do pray at meal times, even if, as many do, they call upon the name of Jehovah, give him thanks for the food that is before him, and ask him to bless it to them, even if they pray. Because God abominates all the prayers which are offered by unbelievers. Because the proverb says, the prayer of the wicked is an abomination with the Lord. And God abominates every prayer which is not made in the name of Jesus Christ. Because only in Him does God hear anything good from this planet. And so we've had tables in Jewish homes all around the world in answer to this prayer with their food and drink being a snare, a trap, and a stumbling block as a recompense or reward or punishment for their sins of unbelief and self-righteousness. That's what the text says. And it can't be made to say anything else. By extension though, this principle holds good for all the reprobate wicked Gentiles as well as Jews. There has never been a table in all the history of the world which has been used by those outside of Christ and reprobate that actually brought common grace or favour to them. It's impossible. The unbelieving Jews who were part of the nation that historically God chose, the reprobate in them, they didn't receive common grace through them Never mind the unbelieving Gentiles. And the truth is that grace is not common. So a lot of true statements we can make about grace, but the statement grace is common is emphatically not one of them. Grace is not common. Grace is uncommon. It is uncommon. That's what we believe in. Uncommon grace. Distinguishing, distinctive particular grace for all those in Jesus Christ, for all those for whom he died <laughs> for the elect. In fact, you could even lawfully <coughs> and properly apply Romans 11 verse 9 to the administration of the Lord's Supper in apostate churches. And God does too. Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. And that's the way it is in the Church of Rome with the blasphemy of the Mass in which Jesus Christ is offered up again for the sins of the living and the dead. And in which the wafer is worshipped as true God. That's the way it is too in the administration of the supper in which impenitent homosexuals are allowed to partake. Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. 
That's what God does too. 1 Corinthians 11 teaches this too, the general principle that those who come to the Lord's body, the Lord's table, and do not properly discern the Lord's body, eat and drink damnation to themselves. Verse 9 then is David's prayer concerning their table. And in verse 9 is David's prayer against common grace, which is an alleged love of God for the reprobate in earthly good things. You could say at verse 10 is David's prayer against the free offer, which is a supposed desire of God to save the reprobate. Common grace just deals with earthly, natural things. The love of God for the reprobate and those. The free offer says that God actually wants to save them and forgive their sins and give them everlasting life. And according to this notion, Almighty God wills, wants, wishes, and desires to save everybody, head for head, including the reprobate, more emphatically, these are their own words, God sincerely, earnestly, and passionately, with all that's in him, wants to save every individual person, including the reprobate. And when we say save, think biblically, Save, that's a broad concept. Saving someone includes electing them. You can't save someone without them being elected. Saving someone includes Christ dying for them. That's the only way in which anybody can be saved, even the elect. Saving someone includes that they be regenerated or given the spiritual life of Christ. That they be called with the effectual call. That they be declared righteous with Christ's own obedience put to their account, that they be adopted as God's sons and daughters, that they be sanctified and weaned more and more from worldliness and sin, and that they ultimately be glorified so that they shine as the angels in heaven forever and ever. And saved also includes spiritual illumination. So if someone has wisdom and knowledge to know the mind of God revealed in sacred scripture, and to acquiesce in it as the will of God. So according to this free offer, which is a very popular position, not just with the Arminians, but most who call themselves Calvinists believe that nonsense. According to that view, necessarily, God earnestly and passionately wants to open the eyes of every reprobate person. That's included in salvation. He wants to open the eyes of all the reprobate so that they see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ and repent and trust in Jesus. Now what does David pray? Verse 10. Let their eyes be <coughs> darkened that they may not see. I ask you. And if God really wants to save the reprobate, includes and that includes opening their eyes so that they see the gospel, why in all the world does David, the man after God's own heart, pray the exact opposite? And why does God have David pen these inspired words in Psalm 69? And why does God have, David, have Paul quote these inspired words in the New Testament in Romans 11 verse 10? Because this prayer of David is a good prayer, a God-honoring prayer, a prayer that was answered, an instructive prayer for the admonition and teaching of the church. Let their eyes be darkened, says the man after God's own heart, that they may not see. And if God wanted everyone's eyes to be opened, which is the necessary teaching of the free offer, then David's prayer would have to be sin. Because he would be praying against God's revealed will. But it's not sin. And that's why it's quoted in the Old and New Testament. It's not sin because it is God's will that some people's eyes be darkened. Which is the exact opposite of a theory which is widely accepted as proper wisdom and true Calvinism. Which is a sheer disgrace 